Welcome to episode 24 of the Watchman Privacy Podcast. Jameson Lop, Privacy Rebooting and Private Secure Bitcoin. I'm Gabriel Custodiat, a privacy consultant and author of the Watchman Guide to Privacy, which you can find on Amazon. I'm also pleased to announce that my cryptocurrency privacy course, in conjunction with Joshua Sheets of Radical Personal Finance, has a date. That date is March 22nd for the first session, with a second session to follow the next week. Here's the way this works. It will be a live event and broken into two parts. You will also have access to the recording. In total, you're looking at around five hours, including Q&A, but we will also be including a basic digital privacy tutorial, a video, and other resources to look at at your leisure. In the course, we will be laying out multiple methods to purchase Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies privately. We will also discuss how to use this crypto privately and how to store it privately and securely. Basically, we will be discussing everything you need to start exploring crypto without attaching it to your personal identity while retaining full custodial ownership of it. This is incredibly important. I've been working on this a long time. I was not content with the incomplete, inaccurate, and overly complex information that I found online while researching it, so I made my own course. I'll be coming out with a full breakdown of what the course entails in the coming days, which I will release on this podcast. You can find out more and sign up at bitcoinprivacycourse.com. That's bitcoinprivacycourse.com. One other brief note. In honor of this course, I will be spending March and part of April discussing topics pertaining to cryptocurrencies. In this episode, I speak with Jameson Lopp, a cybersecurity programmer. He is the CTO, the Chief Technology Officer, and co-founder of CASA, which is a fascinating multi-signature Bitcoin wallet and an editor for the BTC Times, a crypto publication, among other roles. Jameson was a perfect guest for this show. Not only is he serious about the use of technology and programming to help people achieve privacy and self-sovereignty, in other words, a cypherpunk, but he takes his private leak quite seriously outside of the digital world as well. This began when Jameson was the victim of a swatting attack a few years ago. He has told the story on many forums, and I have linked his own account of the event in the notes of the video version of this show. Basically, several lowlifes became upset with Jameson online and managed to find his home address, most likely through the myriad people search websites that plague the internet today. One of these people called in a series of threats to the local police, and this led to Jameson's entire neighborhood being shut down. Fortunately, Jameson was not in his house, and the situation was resolved amicably. This has not been the case in other swatting events, where people have actually been killed. It's a serious thing. In the aftermath of this event, Jameson went to privacy extremes, spending tens of thousands of dollars to hire lawyers, set up trusts and holding companies, and really getting off the grid in a serious way. I wanted to talk to him, not necessarily about the swatting event, but the strategies he deployed afterward, all of which only emphasize my suggestion in the Watchman Privacy Guide to protect your physical house before anything else. I also wanted to talk to Jameson about some basic digital privacy and security matters, and finally about Bitcoin privacy and his experience as the chief technology officer of CASA, a Bitcoin wallet and service that forces people to disperse control of their Bitcoin to five separate sources, controlled by you still, and thus ensuring that it does not have a single point of failure. This is one episode you don't want to miss. Jameson Lopp, welcome to the uh, Watchman Privacy Podcast. How are you doing? Not bad. Always a good day to talk about privacy. Absolutely. And I must say, uh, Jameson, that you are an ideal guest for this show. You're a crypto guy, and we're going into a month of crypto coverage here. You're also huge into privacy. You've done a full reboot, which we'll discuss, uh, and you promote privacy. But you're also a a down-to-earth guy. You're interested in making privacy and crypto available to and accessible to everyone. So you don't have this uh, personality or elitism as some in the crypto and especially the cybersecurity community have. So thanks. Yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of a weird uh, stance to be in, to be both pro privacy and a somewhat public figure, you know, promoting privacy. Uh, it certainly throws some people for a loop and, and seems antithetical. And uh, the best way that I can describe it is that, sure, if I wanted, you know, even stronger, better, perfect privacy, then the obvious solution is I would just delete myself from the internet and, you know, never talk to anybody. Like, that's how you achieve perfect privacy by not ever leaking any information. But I have chosen 
what I believe is a more difficult path to follow because I still want to be able to share my knowledge. I want to be able to continue to leverage my reputation and I, I want to be able to continue to build and interact with people and to do that while still retaining what you would consider to be the more important and more sensitive aspects of your life that you want to keep private is definitely a challenging thing to do. Yeah, for sure. That's that's definitely the, the paradox of uh, being being public about privacy. I also wanted to recognize your website, lop.net, L-O-P-P.net, which is a just an incredible resource for people interested in Bitcoin and crypto. It's one of the best resources out there. So I, I would encourage people to uh, look into that, L-O-P-P, lop.net. I wanted to start, Jameson, with some practical things we can discuss regarding your privacy reboot. Quick summary, of course, you got swatted. Kid got access to your physical address. He called in a uh, essentially a SWAT team, uh, which cordoned off your neighborhood uh, and caused all kinds of havoc. It was very costly. And you decided at that point to take your property and such out of your real name and put it in the name of trusts and LLCs, presumably, and, and things of this nature from that. And my first question was, how did this kid, how did he find your physical address? Uh, I don't know exactly, but I can tell you that anybody with 10 or 20 bucks who was willing to go to one of the dozens of you know public people finder engines would have been able to find it. Uh, it's just sort of the nature of how the modern economy works, that you own things, you create accounts with many different services, um, and then any of those that are in any way connected to sort of the credit system and the financial system, they end up all getting aggregated together either by credit reporting companies or by other shadier uh, data collection and reseller companies. And, and so at, at the end of the day, if you're going about your normal life operating as everyone else does, then the default is that your name and address will one way or another, get correlated together and become fairly public or easily accessible information. So while I don't know exactly what tool was used, I found out in hindsight that it was not difficult at all. And in fact, it may have may have even just been a simple Google search because I had been living in the same place for over 10 years and, and you know leaked out my name and address to thousands of different entities. Basically, you were, you were out there using using your real name online, and it was a matter of just going to one of these hundreds of very, very shady people search sites and getting some of this information that has been collected from all kinds of things, voting records, all, all kinds of databases, some of which are public. It's just the, the nature of the internet that as you go about your business, as you're browsing the internet, as you're interacting with hundreds and thousands of, of different machines and companies around the world that you are leaking information like a sieve uh, if you're not very careful about what you're doing. And ultimately, as we were saying earlier, that information all gets aggregated, collected, disseminated, sliced and diced a million different ways, and it will get used against you somehow. Now, maybe it'll only get used against you to try to sell stuff to you, but maybe some more malicious person uh, will try to use that against you in, in innumerable other ways. I wanted to, before we get into more of the digital privacy stuff, just get a little bit more about your privacy reboot. You dealt along the way with a lot of lawyers to help you set up the legal entities to own property and this and that. You said that you've spent around $100,000 on the whole endeavor. Looking back at that process, which as you said, not a lot of people are going to do, but for the people that do want some idea of this, what is what is some advice and general observations that you took away from that whole legal experience? Well, I mean, the first thing you need to recognize is that this is a very uncommon path that not many people walk. And so when you then are, are going out and trying to find service providers, whether that's uh, lawyers or other just sort of semi-trusted people to act as, as proxies for various aspects of your life, that um, you're going to encounter some friction and you're going to probably have to talk to a number of different people before you even find the right fit either the person or company or entity or whatever that is willing to, to work with you because it'll probably be a novel thing for them. And you know, in general, people don't like uh, ha having to learn and do new things. 
that was something that I ran into both on the privacy side and on sort of the whole aftermath of the swatting incident and, and trying to uh, find justice uh, for myself with that, because that was once again, another type of legal path that not many people go down, basically trying to prosecute their own case rather than you know having state-based uh, resources doing the prosecution. Right. And that was a very interesting story of you tracking down this guy who did that to you. And I'll put links to both that and your ruminations on going through this extreme privacy reboot in the notes so that people can take a look. It's quite a compelling information. Now, when some people do this kind of complete reboots, they'll, as you said, they'll run into some problems because the world is not designed for people who don't have things in their own name and all the rest. And I'm just curious if, for example, credit reports are, are something that uh, people who have done reboots or who own uh, various things in the name of various entities, uh, they sometimes have trouble getting access to their, just something as simple as their credit reports. Have you had any trouble with that? Are, are there any things that have come about as a result of, of this privacy reboot that you hadn't thought of and that have been a little bit uh, of a hindrance for you? Oh, for sure. Uh, and I probably won't even remember them all. But um, if you are going for extreme privacy, then you obviously are going to have to make sacrifices. And there are certain things that are just simply incompatible with privacy. One of those is, you know, Ownership of any publicly registered assets, so you know, houses, cars, whatnot. Um, voting is incredibly antithetical to privacy, at least in the United States, because uh, that creates public records. And you'll have to think about how you want to even manage your own persona uh, and and your relationships with your neighbors, for example. And so, you know, I took that to the extreme and I said, well, basically walking away from my existing neighborhood and moving somewhere new and because I can't trust anybody not to leak information, I have to tell my neighbors that I am some completely other identity. And then I have to get used to that. And, and that was one of the bigger things is really building a new persona and being able to stick with it. And, you know, it's, it's almost like putting yourself in a witness protection program. Yeah. Back when, before I had uh, done some of this stuff myself, I remember getting a note on my, my door. Uh, one day, and it was addressed to my own name. And I realized that one of my neighbors who was just trying to get in touch with me about something in the yard where our, our yards kind of uh, connected, they had just gone to the local records uh, that are available. And uh, they they saw my name attached to the house. And there you go. So yep. <laughs> um, but l let me ask your and what you said also reminds me of a, a good Robert Frost quotation, he says, uh, fences make great neighbors. So what about utilities. Do you have any advice for people trying to get utilities not in their own name? Yes. Yeah, so, and, and I should have mentioned this as well, like one of the other major sacrifices that you have to give up with extreme privacy is credit. You know, credit is based upon your personal history of you know, financial dealings. And um, it's also extremely antithetical to privacy because, you know, that data gets disseminated amongst many different entities. And then almost anybody else who wants to can then basically pull your information. Um, and and I do, on a regular basis, I have not on, only my credit report, but basically like an entire rundown on my identity pulled by private investigators, you know, not only from public databases, but also from semi-private databases that you generally have to be either law enforcement or a private investigator credentialed person to get into. And I, I basically just do that to check up, uh, do a health check and make sure I haven't been leaking anything. But when you don't have credit, uh, this is yet another reason why privacy or at least extreme privacy is expensive. You had better be willing and able to you know pay for everything with straight up cash and that was actually you know a, a mistake that i made early on was trying to figure out a way to do a house that was owned by an llc but still had a mortgage on it and uh, actually what happened was the lender ended up you know leaking it may not even have happened the first year that i did it but eventually 
the the lender ended up leaking some like my personal my my actual name and uh, you know associating it with that mortgage uh, and I think it showed up on a credit report for a bit and of course I freaked out and had to tell them to take it off but that basically it, it goes to show how difficult it is to once again go against the grain is because even when I initially set stuff up and I was working both with a private banker and an attorney who they knew everything that was going on, they knew why we were doing it. They went to the the utmost extreme that they could to to keep things private. And my understanding is that inevitably it was just, you know, something with the the back end systems where the data automatically gets uh, ingested, shuffled around, uh, reused for other things, that there were some leaks that happened. And kind of going actually back to your story, I was at a house that I had purchased with, well, through an LLC and uh, received some mail there in my name, which should have never happened because there was nothing that should have associated my name with that address. And you know what it was? It was it was either a holiday card or a birthday card or something from the bank. Oh you know, no! That uh, the, the mortgage had been through, and and it was because all of their systems are tied together, and so some random system you know pulled up my information in the database and said, "Hey, send this guy a holiday card." Yeah, it, it can get so messy. One, one of the most aggravating, but also entertaining episodes I've listened to of Michael Bazell's podcast was when he tries to go in and buy a, a new car uh, in the name of uh, an entity without giving out any personal information. And uh, mm-hmm. let's just say he got kicked out of uh, many a place. You mm-hmm. said at the time of this swatting that one of the reasons why you didn't want the police to do a search of your home, obviously there was there was, there was was nothing there and you don't want police coming into your home, was that you had multiple guns sitting around. And I'm just yep. curious for our American listeners who live in a civilized country where they don't come at you with guns for having your own guns. Uh, mm-hmm. Since then, have you made any changes to your gun privacy? Interesting, like from, from a privacy standpoint, I actually have not purchased any new weapons in several years. Um, and and part of that is is because you know normally I've always done it through federally licensed firearm dealers. I have made perfectly legal private purchase sales in the past. Can be a little bit weirder to do. Um, just takes a little more effort to be careful. But I guess it just it hasn't really been at the top of my list. I've I've felt like I've I, I mean I've been collecting firearms for. 15, 20 years now. And I, I feel like at least from a personal defense standpoint, my collection is sufficient. Um, I will probably eventually want to d- get into collecting m- more antiques, curios, relics and stuff. I actually had a, a federal license for doing that for a few years, though that was a huge privacy problem in and of itself because you have to sure. fill out a lot of paperwork and you have to actually essentially give permission to the the ETF to come and check in on you and check your, your logs and everything. So I, I actually let that expire as a result of my desire for more privacy. But from a security perspective, I, I still I still go about my self-defense in pretty much the same way that I had before, where at, at any of my locations, I have a decentralized series of quick access safes, which will you know have the firearms that I am familiar with and believe are best suited for home defense situations. You know, starts to kind of get off into a whole other tangent, uh, which I've written extensively on as well, but it's more on the, you know, the physical security rather than privacy side of it. Fire, yeah, it's actually just the, the title of it is just called Firearms for Home Defense. Yeah, I, I basically talk about all the different considerations. And, um, you know, some of these things could be applied to other weapons if, if you're in a country that is not firearm ownership friendly. You know, the, the long and short of it is that you know, if you want to be able to defend yourself, then you need to have a plan and a way to be able to access whatever weapons you can uh, in a very short time period if you believe that you know someone is attacking you because you probably won't have uh, a lot of time to go you know spend 30 seconds or whatever on a, a dial combination safe to try to open it up you know while you're in the heat of the moment and fearing for your life Exactly. So you've had various interactions with the police, both at the time of this event and presumably in, in subsequent years. 
And we recommend on this podcast, Boston Tea Party's book, You and the Police, uh, which is a great place for people to start. Any observations about uh, how to handle interactions with police? A lot of this stuff is very jurisdictional specific. So, you know, it's not really possible for me to even give uh, state level advice because I'm not familiar with all the different states and their guidelines, much less uh, to give international advice. So really the most important thing is for each person to do research on exactly what the requirements are in your jurisdiction because there, there are different levels of compliance that are required. Now, I think one of the many things that I have mentioned in the past is that, like we said, we, we want to avoid leaking public information. And one of the many types of public information that can get out there is unfortunately police reports. So what you want to do is avoid the police as much as possible. You know, you you want to be the perfect model citizen. You don't want to break any laws. You don't even want to get traffic citations uh, because these are all things that can end up creating records that eventually get disseminated and ingested once again by all of those services and can essentially create uh, traces that people can start to follow. That's a good point. A lot of people think that their car gets broken into, they have a shattered windshield, call the police right away. But if you can afford the $100 fix and you can stay off of a police record, in most cases, that's perfectly legal, then you should certainly consider whether that's the, the best course of action for you. And, and, you know, in insurance, for example, you know, you, you still obviously have to deal with insurance for various things. And in many cases, insurance is legally required for certain things. But whenever you're dealing with an insurance company, as far as I can tell, that's a fairly private interaction. Um, you know, I still have insurance coverage with, with various providers, and I have never had any of that leak and, and show up on any of my investigations that I have performed against myself. You know, hopefully if you need to file an insurance claim, you can do so without also filing a police report, but that can also, you know, vary uh, from provider to provider. Maybe I could follow up uh, here with a, a few kind of basic computer privacy questions. If someone is using a Linux distribution and they are taking basic good OPSEC, are they by and large safe from your average uh, cyber threat? Well, you're going to be safe from most of the common malware uh, that ends up infecting usually Windows machines. I guess that sometimes we're, we're seeing some Mac OS uh, malware get out there. It's, it's hard to say, though, if that's necessarily because Linux is uh, more securely designed uh, or if it's just because it's uh, such a small target in the sense that not many people run Linux machines. So if you're a malware writer, you're going to be targeting the, the distributions that, of course, have the most people running it. And maybe it doesn't really matter either way, but it's it's still, it's not a panacea. I mean, there are still a million different things that can just happen at the web browser level. You know, a lot of, of hijacking that, that happens can, can happen through something like a, just a, a web browser plugin or, you know, an extension, for example, that can be malicious and can basically take over the entire web browser. So you still, you still have to be careful. You don't, want to install software if you don't absolutely need it. You don't want to install software unless it's actually reputable. Good advice. As regards VPNs, uh, a specific question. A lot of people who use VPNs have noticed websites discriminating against them in various ways. Shops online will cancel orders because they detect fraud, etc. Have you noticed this? And do you have any strategies, I guess, more importantly, for getting around that? Absolutely. I mean, you're essentially a second class citizen because you you automatically get red flagged by a variety of different, you know, denial of service or other firewall type systems that various commercial services will erect because if they don't do that, then they're going to get hit uh, by criminals who are trying to mask their behavior. And it's... Um, It's unfortunate and it's once again really one of those uh, your mileage may vary type of issues. So, you know, I've had 
plenty of times when I just try to open a website and it's just straight up blocked. Usually it'll be a sort of more security conscious, like financial site or something like that. That's a bit more locked down. And if that's the case, then I may simply try switching you know, VPN servers a few times to see you know, how comprehensive their blacklist is. And if that doesn't work, I may try switching to you know, a completely different uh, VPN provider. You know, these things only take a few seconds to do if, if you have the, uh, the VPN software installed. You know, worst case scenario, if there's something where you absolutely, you know, need to be on clear net, but you don't want to be leaking your home IP address, then Starbucks. you can always just, yeah, go go to your local uh, free Wi-Fi place. I mean, it, free Wi-Fi is so pervasive if you're anywhere near civilization that it's uh, it's not usually too much of an inconvenience to do. But then also... I think in my experience, Google and Apple are some of the worst when it comes to their fraud detection in the sense that they have the, the, the most sensitive fraud protection. I think Amazon's pretty bad too. But for example, I, uh, for many years, had a, a Google Fi phone, which was awesome because it was basically unlimited bandwidth anywhere in like 180. 30 countries for basically 20 or $30 a month. And when I, when I tried to improve my privacy, obviously I knew that I had to get rid of my, my current account because it was under my name. And I tried oh, for hours on probably half a dozen different occasions to try to, to, to set up a, a Google Fi account using, you know, any of my LLCs or other entities and, they would they would just block it immediately and, and not let me finish setting up the account and getting uh, a phone. So I ended up having to use some uh, random you know international SIM card provider with an Android phone that I basically bought from some other random website and had shipped to a, a remailer box all under the name of an LLC. So you know it's it's unfortunate sometimes just how much more difficult those fraud detections can make your life if you're trying to. Uh, protect yourself. This unfortunately gets a bit more technical uh, because I expect most people just use commercial VPNs and that's a whole other um, can of worms in and of itself is like which ones are the good ones. Um, and I have several links on my website to try to help people uh, differentiate. But you can, of course, always run your own VPN. Uh, right. I'm not I've never heard of anyone who is running their own VPN uh, getting blocked like this, and and I don't know why you would because you wouldn't you wouldn't show up on any blacklist because there would there would be nobody else performing malicious activity through your own personal VPN's IP address. I guess for for me, I see one of the benefits of a VPN as sharing a IP address with a a group of people to kind of generate some some anonymity. Let me ask you uh, a different question. You mentioned in your privacy article where you talk about doing the reboot that uh, Shia LaBeouf had his secret art uh, collection found from just some people on 4chan who were doing some basic putting of evidence together based on the things that he's revealed or, or, or said or the background of his photos, his exit data, whatever the case may have been. And I'm just curious if you could give the audience a sense of what are some of the little things that we do or post or say that reveal us enough. I believe there was a lady in, in Japan who was a, some kind of influencer and a stalker tracked her down just based on you know seeing a sign for the subway stop in a reflection of, of a puddle uh, on a photo that she had. And he just waited for her and, and got her one day. So wh what are some of the, the things that we are revealing just in very mundane activities that could lead up to, to bigger and, and worse events? Yeah. If you're doing anything on social media, that is a really big avenue for you to leak information, um, especially if you're posting uh, videos or photos. There can be quite a bit of metadata that's embedded in there. Now, one thing that I do like about Twitter, which I think not many people ever bring up is that they actually strip all of the metadata out of at least of images that you post. I, I have an additional exif stripper tool that I use myself before I post anything just because I'm extra paranoid, but I would not expect for you know, the average social media platform to, to go to that length. Now, if we're talking about just what might you be leaking, 
you know, even if all you're doing is posting uh, little text tweets with nothing else, uh, if you're not using a VPN, of course, you're going to be leaking your IP address, which can be used to get a, a coarse geographic location on you. Even just from the the patterns of the time of day that you're posting will most likely, over a long enough period of time, give people a very good idea of at least um, what time zone you're in uh, based on your sleeping patterns. If you're if you're posting audio or video, though, you have to realize that those things contain so much more information. They're just really information-rich media that you never know uh, what you might be leaking. Like you said, it could be uh, something in the reflection or the background of a photo or a video. Um, it could even be, you know, audio like uh, perhaps the the sound of an airplane or a train. Not completely unique noises, but uh, unique enough that especially if you have enough data points over a series of time, then people can start triangulating all of the possible places that it could be and then continue to you know, whittle down and whittle down further and further. And I think if I recall correctly from that story about uh, LeBeouf, he eventually the final triangulation happened because some of the the crazy fans who were trying to track him down were literally driving around in the rough area where they thought he was and honking their horns and then waiting for other people to hear those honks uh, over the live stream. Let me move on. Uh, I want to get to crypto and and Casa, which is your your service. But uh, if I may, I'd just like to do a few rapid fire kind of what is your preferred software? Just to start, what is your preferred password manager? I like 1Password. Um, it has a lot of features. It's open source. It works well with with teams and sharing, and it, and it works on pretty much every platform. Um, it even runs well, and this is a, a big one for me. Uh, its mobile application runs on Graphene OS, uh, you know, the completely stripped down, de-Googleified Android operating system. Preferred 2FA application? Uh, Yubico's OTP manager that you can use with the YubiKey to keep the secrets on the YubiKey. A daily driver operating system? Ubuntu. What percentage of your browser usage would you say is on the Tor browser? Ooh, less than 1%, actually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what about your daily driver phone operating system? Graphene OS. Search engine? DuckDuckGo. Do you have a VPN at the router level? Sometimes, uh, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> sure. But, um, but n n lately, no, um, and it's an ongoing project, and I, I believe there's, you know, technology will continue to improve, but wrong right. story. And then preferred VPN. I'm a fan of Mulvad uh, and and any other WireGuard based VPNs, especially the ones that uh, accept crypto and don't require email addresses for setting up accounts. Excellent. Let me move on to some crypto questions. What is the first thing that you would say people have to understand about? Let's start with Bitcoin. About Bitcoin and privacy. Well, that the the design of Bitcoin in many ways is highly antithetical to privacy. It, it really is meant to be a very open and transparent system. And the reason for that is to maintain the integrity of the system against malicious actors trying to you know, double spend money or defraud you, uh, you know, basically to corrupt the actual monetary properties of the system. And so... People will sometimes say, well, why are people using Bitcoin? You should use a privacy coin like Monero, which hides the blockchain. Is Monero, by hiding the blockchain, contradicting the uh, whole point of, of the blockchain, which you just said, which is to be transparent? Oh, this is a fun rabbit hole to go down. And um, suffice to say that I believe, especially if you're performing any activities that you want to be uh, private, that you know they're sensitive for any reason, like, for example, paying for a VPN, then absolutely you should use Monero. Um, it, it's, I don't think it's controversial to say that it has far better uh, privacy by default than Bitcoin. Now, is it going against some of the properties. Um, no, it's it's just making some slightly different uh, assumptions. Basically, you you have to have some additional trust in the, the ring signature aspects of the system that no one is able to inflate the money supply. But 
I would say that, you know, in terms of the ethos of Monero, that it, it makes sense because it places a greater weight on privacy, whereas Bitcoin places a greater weight on auditability and um, transparency of the system. Interesting. What a lot of people don't talk about is how to acquire Bitcoin to begin with privately. Do you have any thoughts on the best ways to acquire Bitcoin privately? By offering goods and services for it. <laughs> I mean, that's right. absolutely uh, by engaging in commerce or other means of exchange privately between yourself and and one other person directly, you know, in a peer to peer fashion as it was originally intended. Now, if that's not an option uh, for whatever reason, if if you're not, you know, operating some sort of business that can do that, then you have to figure out a way to basically do an, an over the counter, you know, or face to face trade. And there's a there's a variety of platforms that will let you do that. The one thing that I caution people on is don't obviously take a don't take a, a suitcase full of cash and meet some random person in a parking garage and, and you know expect to do a face to face trade unless you know you're also bringing a whole lot of security and, and taking other precautions. Um, there are a few peer to peer trading apps where you can basically set up a uh, multi-signature base escrow and and do it uh, you know over the internet without having to take the uh, the physical risks that that come with doing a face-to-face -face trade. Good advice. You hear or I hear these days of tainted Bitcoin of Bitcoin that institutions see as having at some point been tied to a crime and therefore they don't accept it or they might even report it. Is that something that's on your radar? And if so, what what, what is to be done about it? Well, yeah, not only that, but uh, what we've seen over the past couple of years is more of the regulated financial institutions considering anything within several hops of your activity on their system uh, to potentially be suspicious. And so uh, something as simple as if you withdraw your Bitcoin from an exchange and then send it to a mixer, they might see that and shut down your account because they just think it's too risky. Or if the opposite happens and you know you you have funds that you have sent through a mixer uh, and then you deposit them on the exchange, they may do the same thing, shut down your account, and say, you know, we have decided not to service you anymore. However, it's only really a problem when you're dealing with these regulated institutions. Like you're you're not going to go buy a computer from some retailer who is accepting Bitcoin and you know they're not going to perform that level of, of analysis on you because from their perspective, all they care about is the fact that they got paid. And you know, once that Bitcoin hits their account, they know that it's it's not going to be charged back and they're, they're going to send the, the goods or provide the service to you. It's just something that I, I think about more often when... I'm managing my own wallets and I just, I make sure that if I have a wallet where I've been mixing or doing more private or sensitive activities with it, I just make sure I never, never let those funds be associated with any of these regulated institutions. Well, that's good advice. And it leads into a, another question, which is what is the best way for people to go forward using their Bitcoin? in a way that does not expose their various aspects of their identity over time. So what I think a lot of people will tell you is that, you know, you need to be mixing your coins. I don't necessarily uh, subscribe to that uh, for one, because we, we don't necessarily know just how good the mixers are. I mean, there was just some news that came out today talking about Wasabi wallets, coin joins getting, um, traced and and demixed and there's also the question of who are you actually trying to protect yourself from so when it comes to mixers i don't think it makes sense to be like regularly mixing your coins what i think it makes sense uh, to use mixers for is if you want to make a payment and you don't want the recipient to be able to just go onto a blockchain explorer and you know trace it back one or two hops and see oh you know, this person has 
hundreds of thousands of dollars because they can now see uh, you know, a large portion of what your total holdings are just due, due to the nature of how the, the blockchain has linked all the transactions together. Uh, so I think it makes sense to use them when needed as making a payment. Otherwise, Second layer of technologies like Lightning will actually offer better privacy because you know these are actually making the payments off chain. So there there is no explorer that someone can go to and, and look up and, and sort of trace back the payment to your wallet and see your total holdings. You know, Lightning is still uh, gaining adoption. It's been around for a few years, but we're still, I think, on the cusp of it becoming used at the same level as uh, Bitcoin as a whole. Let's talk about storing one's Bitcoin. I know you're a fan of cold wallets. Now, let me ask you this scenario. If someone is using a Linux distribution and they practice fairly good cybersecurity procedures, very careful of what they do online, and they're using an Electrum wallet, is that scenario much more risky than, say, having a cold wallet? Uh, yes. I mean, assuming you mean like you're keeping the keys on Electrum on that internet connected machine. Uh, yeah, there's, there's just a far larger attack surface. Now, is it likely that your machine is going to get compromised and, and the funds stolen if you're careful? Probably not. I mean, in the early days, I had all of my funds sitting in a Bitcoin core uh, GUI wallet on Ubuntu, probably for several years because there were no hardware devices to manage my keys. Right. And how, how would someone, how would someone in all likelihood gain access to your Electrum wallet on a Linux distribution if they were going to? What would be the most likely scenario for them to do that? Uh, I mean, on on a Linux distribution, that's it would have to be some kind of you know crazy new zero day exploit. I would think where you know it would probably have to be a highly targeted thing where you know they would have to essentially get you to to click on something and accidentally install some software that basically allowed them to tunnel into your machine. You know, one of the more common ways that we see people's um, machines get compromised is via like team viewer software or other remote desktop type of software. And, and generally I think what happens is that uh, someone essentially gets targeted and, and scammed uh, usually via something like telegram or discord or, you know, some other you know, social media platform and, and they get tricked into uh, installing the software, then it's basically game over. Now, with Linux, you know, it's not really something, at least that I've heard of very often, of, of someone's Linux machine being compromised. But still, it's just, it's, it takes so little effort, you know, spend $100 <laughs> essentially to get those keys off of the internet connected device. And that just saves you from from even having to worry about the possibility. Right. And we'll get to Casa here in a second. Do you have, though, any cold or hot wallet recommendations or preferences? There's probably hundreds of wallets out there to choose from. I am a big fan of Electrum, at least on desktop. And, you know, if you're they actually have a lightning wallet as well now. So, you know, if you're using that for small amounts of money, that's fine. You know, I wouldn't put thousands of dollars on there. I'm a fan of Samurai Wallet and uh, Blockstream Green uh, for uh, Android and iPhone. If you're going to go with a single one-off hardware device, I'm a fan of the uh, Cold Card. And that's really because it's it's open source. It has been repeatedly attempted to be attacked by various uh, security experts in the space, and it's still held up very well to a variety of of different attacks. And, and even you know having like millions of dollars worth of lab equipment uh, directed at it, trying to extract the seeds from it, and it, it still holds up quite well to that. 
Now, I, I do want to get into Casa, which is your crypto service. Now, maybe we can frame it in the context of the discussion so far, privacy, self-sovereignty. Why was Casa so important for you to develop and what what exactly does it do that helps us with some of these things? Well, what is the what I've really been trying to do is to build a software wallet that has a lot of the best practices built into it because after developing software for 15 years, it's quite clear to me that users are not going to read the manual. You have to create an experience that makes it so that people don't have to go read instructions. You know, it's just as simple as following the directions on the screen. And so what I've learned over the years after seeing a, a wide variety of different catastrophes happen to people is that essentially we need to eliminate single points of failure if people are going to self-custody. And while a lot of the discussions in the space tend to center around the bigger news stories that are usually various types of hacks and thefts and attacks and whatnot, the boring, unfortunate, bigger problem is actually just users making mistakes, screwing up, shooting themselves in the foot and you know, locking themselves out of their own Bitcoin. So when, when we look to eliminate single points of failure, it, it means not only that there's like no single point that an attacker could compromise to steal all your money. It also means that there's no single thing or single mistake or single decision that you can make that would result in you having a catastrophic loss. And we do that via a variety of different ways. We, we use these hardware key managers to get the keys off of the internet to you know close up a lot of those potential exploits and attack vectors. And most importantly, we use a multiple key set so that you're essentially requiring authorizations from multiple different keys that are on multiple different devices. And, and each of these devices should be you know, different brands, uh, essentially different supply chains. And by geographically distributing those devices, you then get additional resilience against loss and, and physical attack because there's no longer any one single catastrophic event, whether it be flood, fire, famine, what have you, uh, that will uh, wipe out you know, all of your keys in one go. Right. And uh, I don't want to bury, bury the lead here. So just to be clear, CASA and the website is, it's keys.casa. It's just keys.casa. Keys.casa. Excellent. Excellent. Not not even a .com domain. Excellent. Love to see those. Love to see the .io domains cropping up as well and, and maybe potential for uh, blockchain uh, domains in the future. But so people go to Casa, they already have their Bitcoin. Maybe it's sitting in Coinbase. They don't like the fact that Coinbase is the actual owner of that Bitcoin and they want to have some more control over it, protect it a little bit. They're not content with just having all of it on an Electrum wallet. Maybe they don't want the hassle of having simply a hardware wallet. What are kind of the first steps for them to get to the point where they have their crypto on Casa and they can use it and take advantage of its features? Yeah, so we have a few different things that we offer. We're, we're not like your average Bitcoin wallet. The, the vast majority of Bitcoin wallets out there are just completely free software that you 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 download, you install, and then you better read the manual and do it yourself. Uh, you you know you may be able to get some email support if you're lucky, and it's not peak hype bull season when everybody's flooding their support. But most of these projects really rely upon community support and re rely upon people doing a lot of research to figure out you know how to to navigate uh, using the system one thing that you're getting with us is you're paying us and you're paying us not only for having a, a great user experience uh, where you know we've worked through all of the the workflows of getting set up and maintaining this key set with multiple devices but you're also paying us for having a uh, a high level of support. And we have a few different tiers there. We have a really entry level tier 
that essentially comes out to about $10 a month, um, which will just get you into a two of three key set. So you'll, you'll have you know, multiple keys in multiple locations, but then depending on your, your level of assets, your paranoia, your general like level of, of service that you want, we have several higher tiers that get into the thousands of dollars per year. And what you're really getting there is uh, like white glove level of service, dedicated uh, client advisor. And we will discuss with you basically anything that you are concerned about on the technical side, on the like how to actually store these devices, on inheritance issues. It's, uh, you know, it's much more than just key management. It's actually, you know, how do you incorporate this whole idea of being your own bank into your life? You talk a lot about self-sovereignty and having your own private keys. Now, let's say your crypto is on Casa. Do you at any point have to get approval permission or reach out to somebody besides yourself in order to make use of of that crypto right and so like i said one of our, our primary tenets is to eliminate single points of failure and that includes ourselves as a company so one of the first things that actually happens when you finish setting up your account is you get an email that is, is personalized and gives you step-by-step -step instructions on what to do in a worst case scenario. We call this the sovereign recovery process, but basically it's because we're not reinventing the wheel, we're not doing anything out of the ordinary or novel that's like proprietary to us. We're using standards and well uh, available industry hardware that uh, is produced by other companies, you know, once again, uh, continuing to decrease the, the level of trust that you have on us. But uh, point being, you can recreate your entire setup and spend your money without ever touching CASA's software, without ever touching our servers. Uh, as long as you have uh, you know, sufficient quorum of keys and you have the data required to initialize uh, that multi-sig wallet, there are you know, multiple other compatible pieces of software out there that are completely unrelated to CASA that you can do that in. And we provide instructions for that. Thank you again, Jameson. And just so people are reminded, it's keys.casa, C-A-S-A. -A. And I also recommend his website, lop.net, L-O-P-P.net. All kinds of great resources there for beginners, uh, even. With that said, any other places, Jameson, that you'd like to direct people? Not offhand. I mean, I think you'll you'll be able to find a lot of my ruminations uh, on my website, on my blog, and um, you know the main thing that I try to get across to people is that you don't need to feel overwhelmed by any of this. It's 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 much like going down any rabbit hole of any particular subject. You don't need to go all the way to the bottom. Uh, you can just spend a few hours here and there continuing to pick away at it. And the, the same is true for privacy in general, uh, for learning about Bitcoin and you know, continuing to increase uh, and, and fortify your posture there uh, with your holdings. People should take this approach to you know, all of the important aspects of your life is that while it's good to go really deep on some subjects and be an expert, um, you, know, you also need to have some breadth and just spend a little time here and there and you know, continue learning. And that's the, the most important thing is just don't stop learning. 